Hello, good morning, everybody. My name is Tamsin Rose, a senior fellow at Friends of Europe working on health. And this morning, we're going to be talking about the health data revolution in Europe. How do we make it happen? Now, the health sector is about 10 years behind most other sectors in adoption of digital tools, even though it's the sector that produces the most information. Well, the European Commission's ambitious plans recently launched for a health data space are designed to kickstart this so we can move to the point where, as they said in their launch message, data saves lives. And this morning I have three excellent speakers who are going to share some of their insights and help us to explore this issue. And today I'm going to start with Godfried Ludwig, who's the head of the Directorate General for Digitization and Innovation at the German Ministry of Health and a European Young Leader. So let's start with you, Godfrid. Germany was a bit of a slow coach in adopting telemedicine and digital health. And then you have a new Minister of Health, Dr. Jens Spahn, who's a real evangelist and put it at the centre of government decision-making. And just a year ago, you put out a new piece of legislation on Digital Supply Act to try and move this along. How far did that help you when earlier this year, as a result of the pandemic, Almost overnight, everything had to go online. All healthcare delivery had to use digital tools. Godfrid. So first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me and for inviting me to this uh, very inspiring round uh, of discussion and following the, the question of how can we use digitalization um, to fight the pandemic and actually to create a better outcome uh, of healthcare. Um, and I, remembering the first days, uh, like two and a half years ago, there was a huge discussion also in Germany, do we really need digitalization? You know, isn't that something just to play around and it's hip and it's like the buzzword of the year, but is that really of importance for healthcare? And I think looking back to the last 12 months, it really showed that digitalization could help us so much. Thinking about telemedicine, teleconsultation, remote patient monitoring, all of that was set up actually, allowed and reimbursed uh, through legislative approaches in Germany within the last uh, two years under the leadership of Jens Spahn. And all of that really helped us in this crisis uh, to help people who were not, not, you know, not really allowed again to go to the doctor's practices, to be in the, in the traditional way um, uh, of, be, of, 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 of receiving health care and receiving help. We saw that talking about technology, thinking about the, the, the tracing apps, so the corona warning apps, so like how are we capable to break and identify infection chains. So there were a lot of examples where we saw that digitalization is really of importance and really helped us a lot um, fighting the pandemic. But to be very honest, I think also, as you already mentioned, we were not really the front runners and a lot of things we are now implementing, like the electronic medical record from 1st of January 2021, e-prescription and, and, and other tools like apps uh, on prescription would have helped us even to fight better the pandemic. So finally, it shows that the headline, I think, of the European Commission and the European Union with data saves lives is absolutely right. And we have to foster digitalization also in the upcoming month. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Spanner, as you said, has been pushing forward the, the approach of digital on health. And at the launch of the health data space a few days ago at the German presidency conference, he set some very ambitious targets. And he said specifically, by 2025, we want to have an interoperable data access infrastructure in place that would facilitate secure cross-border analysis of health data. So that implies that we've got a system in place, that data is flowing into it, and that we're able to analyze it, use it, and draw lessons at national level. So as, as a country that has suddenly accelerated its investment in digital health, what do you think less, are the lessons we should draw from your recent experience to help build the European health data space? Well, I think to be very to be very honest, I think still we could learn more from others. I mean, I'm delighted that we are talking today with our uh, with our Finnish friends, for example, and and looking at their at their way they or their way they paved in the last in the last years. It's really, I think, a good example um, uh, to follow. So, uh, from our point of view, and and those are also the two things we always put on the agenda the last year. 
um, preparing the, the, the EU presidency. I think from the first thing, we need a reliable legal framework around your Europe. And we saw that the GDPR is, well, interpreted differently <laughs> between member states. And this is why we think that the question of a code of conduct gives us more a reliable, a more reliable legal framework. And on the other hand, um, I think it's important with the joint action group to create a real um, technical infrastructure and to guarantee interoperability. And we are really thankful uh, to our Finnish colleagues who will take the lead with Citra uh, at, at this, as this um, joint action group and that we will uh, move forward. And just let me add one little other thing. I think those two things are really important because they lay the groundwork on a legal and on a technical framework. Um, not having yet spoken about the question of semantic standardization. But at the same time of moving forward um, together and with the whole European Union, I think it's even still important to have a kind of Europe also of pioneers if we talk about like projects of e-prescription between Finland, Estonia and Portugal. If we see like the INFORM project, with this, uh, with it, which is a registry of data um, uh, concerning oncology treatments for children, which now is it's based in Germany and Portugal and Slovenia will, will join this registry. I think we need both. We need um, a framework for whole of Europe. And at the same time, we need a Europe of pioneers where we can move forward very fast. So this is kind of the approach we try uh, to push forward and um, looking really forward uh, and I'm really honored to have two Finnish colleagues actually today with us. So I think they are the best also to talk about their experience and to share uh, their experience with the question of how we can, um, how we can, you know, how we can create a real um, good data space. Thank you, Gottfried. And, and you're absolutely right. We're now going to talk to Jirki Katainen, who is the president of Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund, a former prime minister of Finland and vice president of the European Commission. Now, as Godfrey said, Finland was fast out of the starting blocks on everything digital. So your country has a long history of investing in the infrastructure, the broadband, and the systems that would allow this to move around. And you, as Godfrey mentioned, you are leading the joint action of member states, and you're going to be exploring how the legislation on data protection, the GDPR, applies in the European health data space. So my question to you is, as the Commission has proposed to develop a brand new New data governance act and health will be just one element in that how do we make sure that the specifics of health around the ethics the privacy the equity of access is taken into account in that new data governance act first of all let me thank for having me in this very inspiring discussion and Godfrey thank you very much for your warm words so um, if looking at the big picture uh, there is no market in a world where the use of data would have been regulated democratically. And that's a very, very positive challenge for the EU. We could be the first uh, economic area or the market in a world which has ethically driven, ethically sound and democratically uh, produced uh, rule base for using data, including health and welfare data. So one of the challenges at the moment is that we don't have EU wide regulation on the secondary use of health and welfare data. Finland as a country has one. We were the first one who created this kind of legislation and the data is, uh, is used by innovators, researchers, etc. quite quite well, thanks to this new uh, legislation so this could be one of the uh, one of the goal of joint action to identify how to create uh, the european wide legislation for secondary use of uh, welfare including health data so we need some sort of uh, health union and in my mind this means exactly this what i already mentioned uh, legislation which would level the playing field and which would enable health data flow cross border flow uh, but, but and and in that sense uh, we are talking about the single market of welfare data of course 
trust plays a crucial role and therefore uh, privacy legislation is uh, of utmost importance and and also transparency so uh, in our thinking public health records and public health data is very important basis but we also need to include personal health data so for instance um, there are different kinds of uh, devices pr producing health and well-being data for instance watches or even smart rings and those devices are producing a lot of health data which should flow cross-border as well as um, public uh, registers are flowing hopefully in the future so we, now here we are talking about some sort of um, uh, paradigm shift from curing diseases to producing welfare when private sector can provide services based on on private data and and all the data owners me or you are in a position to keep permission to use my data and if i'm dissatisfied for the quality of the service i can i can swipe the producer out so so we should in one hand concentrate on uh, the secondary use of data regulation but on the other hand also to combine private personal data and public uh, data data registers to this big picture okay Thank you. And as someone, obviously, who's worked with data for a number of years, I'm interested in, in finding out the answer to a question that we've had submitted from Charles-Pierre Astoffli, who is the Secretary General of the Conseil National de Numérique in France and also a European Young Leader. And his question is, what's the data set that doesn't exist yet, but would yield very substantial benefits if it did? So. I mean, you, you mentioned that people are using wearables, rings and other things. And if we got some of this data from the private sphere into the health policy making, this might make a difference. But I, I'm curious, what's the data set you really want to see that you think would be extremely useful to understand? It's exactly this uh, personal health and well-being data. So by providing consent, individuals can grant access to researchers to their the personal data or, or service providers like the private sector. So this is at least as important as the public registers are. So that's why, I mean, I would like to combine this or, or compare this personal health data to to other data sets we are using in the other parts of uh, society. For instance, banking. We do e-banking quite, quite well, cross-border. Or there are other data sets which are used for, uh, for different purposes. So why not my personal well-being data could grow cross-border and it would help to create new jobs, new growth, new services. And Europe could be one health data area uh, in that sense. Okay, thank you. Let me now pass to my, my next speaker. It's Tarja Stenval, who's the Senior Vice President for General Medicines Europe at Sanofi. Now, we, we've spoken about the different sectors and how digital has transformed retail and banking. Pharmaceuticals is also a sector that's very data rich. It's very expensive to run research, and yet digital is starting to transform the way that it works. What can you give us in terms of insight on how digital is transforming your sector? And I realized uh, I was on mute. Huh? Excellent, well, thank you. Tom. You can hear me now. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here today and have a discussion with uh, Jurki and Gottfried. Talking about the digitalization uh, that has really contributed to having more availability of data already in this industry, we've seen acceleration of innovation and also really uh, enriching uh, the um, research ecosystem to be much more vital, which means much more dynamic and also um, much more globally competitive if we look at the Europe. 
industries uh, that are data and uh, research driven, like uh, Sanofi, we use the health data to really um, gain insights and also evidence to really inform our drug development, as well as later stage to really understand effectiveness of different therapies. If I give you some concrete examples, how this availability of new, much broader and online data has helped us. It has really helped us to recognize new drug candidates or like during pandemic, we could see how we've been able to understand new usage of already existing therapeutics. Also the way we run traditional clinical trials, it has really speed up and increased the quality of them, being able to recognize much better the patient pools, much better targeted uh, right clinical trials, as well as really monitor them much faster, recognize issues like safety issues in a very different ways when the data is readily available. Also, if we can have this digitally um, uh, available data across Europe and we can work together with health authorities and regulatory bodies, this could really help without compromising any safety or any standards, how quickly we can also go through regulatory processes of approving new innovations to patients. Uh, I think the pandemic has really shown the need of online data and the quick availability of it. How can we quicker manage diseases, prevent diseases, and also recognize therapeutic um, uh, help uh, for patients. So I think overall digitalization has this real powerful tool of accelerate science. And science will help pharma, in the end it will help patients, it will help us to understand much better diseases and also the therapeutic approaches that we're taking. So it's really, really exciting. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce here a question that we received from Nina Rawal, who's the founder of Emerging Health Ventures and a European Young Leader. And she has a question about how we can make sure that digital works in the pharmaceutical sector to get medicines faster to patients. Let's see her message. Data is key to better understanding both underlying biology and patients' responses to new medicines. And it offers great opportunity to reduce time and cost of clinical trials. The pandemic has shown us that regulators are willing to explore uh, new ways of accelerating vaccines and medicines through clinical development. And so my question is, how can Europe take the lead in shifting the industry further in this direction, where new ways of using data accelerates medicines to market? So thank you for that from, from Nina. And it's, I think, Tari, I'll come back to you because I think here the question is, you know, if data is so critical to better health outcomes for patients, why are we not using it optimally across Europe yet? What are the holdups? Yeah, I think, uh, like Nina mentioned and you said, I think there's a broad consensus that having this health data and through the data being able to really create real world evidence uh, that helps us to understand the outcomes, the variability of outcomes, and what are the causes for this variability and, and, and find uh, better interventions to improve those outcomes. There is a big consensus and we have great examples already of it, uh, not European wide, but from different countries like from Finland. So I think some of the barriers that we really need to overcome to be able to have this broad European wide data and as Nina asked to be really competing with with US or rising China there are barriers we need to overcome with and I think Gottfried and Jurki uh, alluded to some I think there are structural there are legal and there are political um, barriers that we need to overcome and I think first of all it has to be that the healthcare management really takes this availability of data as a real priority um, uh, for driving healthcare. And I think there is now a, a political momentum uh, of really make these difficult things of standardization, common ways of looking at data, a reality. And then lastly, I would like to point out, I think what Jurki mentioned as well, we have to also put the patient very center of it. Uh, we often forget it's not only structural and, and legal and frameworks, you know, the owner of this data and a critical, you know, uh, part of really gaining this data for us is, is a patient and they need to really understand the benefits of that, not only for their immediate help of, of diseases, but how this can really help them to achieve longer and better quality of life in the long term. 
Thank you for that, Daria. And, and I notice that you, you make it very clear that the ownership of the data is with the patient. And that's established, and we have that now in legislation. So the issue of ownership is, is already, if you like, settled. But there's the broader question about the business models of organizations working in the data health sphere. Now, we know in the, the tech sector, in the social media sector, that people who use it, the users, get access to a whole range of tools and convenience and personalization in their lives in return for that data. And it's clear that the business model of many of the, our world's most profitable and richest companies is that the customer is the product. Their data is monetized. Now, does this business model make sense in the health area? Are there ethical questions here? Should a hospital be able to make money off the data of their patients? How do we make sure that the value that's created from the data of the individual, and, and don't forget health data is actually co-created by the patient and the healthcare professional, all, all of the infrastructure and knowledge and support and experience of the health professional together, they co-create it. So here, I'd, I'd like us to explore a little bit this question about data ownership, and if that's really a very helpful concept when we look at the area of health data space. And here we have a contribution from Dr. Pe Petra Wilson. She's a public health um, law specialist and an advisor to the World Health Organization. Let's watch her message. The concept of health data ownership is superficially attractive, seeming to confer rights on the patient. But the term also implies that data can be sold, transacted or otherwise commoditized. Is data ownership a useful concept or should it be avoided? So, members of the panel, how would you like to respond to that? Who wants to pick up on that one? Yerki, can I come to you on this? Because obviously the, the, Finland is, has got legislation in place. You talked about both health data and social welfare data being used. You know, is it a useful concept to, to start from ownership or do we start looking at the issue of value and how health data is a shared public good? Well, I think the most important thing is full transparency. Or So basically, each individual should uh, have full transparency over what happens to his or her data. For instance, I have given... Uh, a health company which is taking care of uh, Citra's um, personnel to use my personal health data for research and innovation purposes. Of course, they don't see my my who, who am I, but, but they can use my health record. And it's my conscious choice because if I can help to further develop healthcare, it's all good. But then if we go further so that uh, people's data is used for for um, private uh, services, then it's also important to have a system where there's a right to be forgotten. So if I'm not con if I'm not satisfied for the quality of the service or for some reasons I want to to stop providing my data to private sector, then I just swipe them out from my from my data flow. So trust is must in in uh, health and welfare data uses, usage. So that, that's why we need, first of all, good privacy law, laws, uh, also other legislation which, uh, which uh, enables full transparency, and then this kind of technical solutions that my data can be used, but I'm I'm the one who says who can use my data and for how long. Uh, in principle, that sounds that sounds great. And I like the fact that I would have control. And if there's someone who I have suspicions of being a bad actor, I can swipe left or swipe right and move them out. But realistically, if you are trying to use a large data set for research or to, to develop a new product, how helpful is it that people are switching in and out if they trust you or not? How realistic? is it that we then have a big data set that's usable if people have the right to hop in and out, like jumping on and off a bus? How would that work? Well, I think we have both public and private, or we have public registers, which are very important for innovators and researchers. There are long timelines, and it gives a good basis for innovation research. But then 
uh, if we are talking about different types of uh, data sets, like uh, everyday wealth uh, data, uh, th so then then uh, this model could function as well. Actually, we have more or less the similar type of system, for instance, in e-banking. So and it functions well. So and and all the data which is used for for uh, financial market development, it's also a very valuable set of data. So uh, it may sound a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, too future looking, but uh, I believe that it's technically possible. And the main thing is that we have a fair uh, rule base, which uh, strengthen transparency and trust among uh, consumers. Okay. Godfried, let me come to you because I think this is an interesting question. Companies that are able to monetize the data that they have access to and use it to develop insight on consumer behavior, develop new products, and I don't need to name them. Everyone knows who these big tech companies are. They are the world's biggest, richest companies. Now, in Europe, where we have healthcare systems that we know are short of money, and are going to need even more money as we get older, et cetera. How do we make sure that some of the economic value that comes from these insights, and remember that a lot of the de data that's being generated is by wearables and other consumer products where the data is in the private sphere, how do we make sure that if there's any financial value that comes from our health data, particularly from our public health data, that that's somehow reinvested back into our healthcare systems? I mean, this might be a new source of revenue for our healthcare systems, or am I being utopian here? Well, I, I mean, I, I there's so many interesting points to to catch up. I think so. First of all, um, I I'm not pretty sure that we already uh, have a consensus um, in the in the regarding the question that we really are allowed. Uh, to use the the data, I remember in Germany last year we um, we we passed finally a legislative approach, um, founding a so-called data research center, where we you know where we where we take all the billing data of ninety percent of the Germans because they are all within the statutory health insurance companies, so ninety percent of the billing data to create a research data center, and this. This was not an easy discussion in the German public, so I, I just I'm not sure. I think I I I'm I, I'm I, I you know I think uh, Taria said said everything was was really I just I just couldn't you know was very well said, but I think we still have to to deliver good examples to uh, the people why data is really or. Uh, why it is really necessary to share your data um, to really create a better outcome. At least from the German public, we, we still face some, some crucial discussions there. Um, and we are really pushing that forward. So don't get me wrong on that. I just think that it's right. We have to tell them where is my benefit and to convince them. So first of all, second, um, from our data model, our basic idea, and I think this could be kind of also European approach, um, this, we don't want, you know, to monetize just the ownership of data. Data. So what do we see in the U.S. is that just companies are owning the data. They are actually buying it in a kind of way. I think the electronic medical record is around worth it. Depends on what is in it. Around two hundred fifty dollars. So they just just buy it. They connect it and then they sell it. And this is a kind of very successful business model at the moment. And I think in a, in a system which is based on solidarity, also from the reimbursement system, um, this could not be the European model. So what we are thinking of is really to create a, a research data center being in a kind of, I don't know if it's necessary state controlled or if it could be a foundation or whatever it is, but someone who collects the data where I can share the data being a, being a patient. Uh, and then this data is obviously open to anyone who you know creates a better outcome out of the data? So monetized should be the treatment, should be the new pharmaceuticals, should be whatever, but it should never be monetized just to own the data, right? So this is the kind of difference um, uh, we are trying um, uh, to make uh, in Germany. I think this could be a good 
a good European model. But first of all, we really have to come to the conclusion all together, and I think Germany is again not the front runner here, so I'm talking a little bit maybe to my own people here. We really have to come to the conclusion that it's necessary to use data, that a data model is always to use it, not to keep it away and just, you know, to hide it. It's we have to use it because if we won't use it, others will, you know, others will use the data. And if we want to have European values within this debate, and if we want to create a new framework in the upcoming um, 10 years uh, within the new future kind of medicine, which will be fundamentally based on the use of data, also on variables and everything else, we have to we have to come to the conclusion and the consensus that we want to use data and that data saves lives and that this means that we are willing to share it. And I think in, in every speech, this is part of it. In any paper, it is part of it. But if I get into legislative discussions in European member states, there's a lot still to do, actually. Also regarding the openness of sharing data with industry or with startups or with anywhere else. Uh, there's always, this is in healthcare, is always tricky and I think just to come to, to a point, data saves lives. So we should, you know, the ownership should not be monetized. The use of data for a better outcome should be monetized. And this is basically the model I think we should, we should, we should come to in Europe. Thank you. Daria, I know you wanted to comment on this issue. Yeah, just very shortly building on what uh, Gottfried was saying, I think ensuring the access, broad access of data should be really on the heart of it. How do we think about the models of making data available? And I think the pandemic and the recent developments have really also shown that you know, this real true collaboration of the parties who all can think that they can use the data in the end, the benefit of a patient and, and, and who knows and maybe monetize it should be part of it. As an example, in France, they're creating a new data hub and really, this is industry, third parties, government, everybody working hand in hand. And everybody has sort of benefit of not only giving the data in, but also getting some information out of that data. And I think that should be really hard to be access and partners working together because everybody sees that they have a benefit of that data in the end to improve then patient health outcomes. Thank you. And, and you, you've finished your point on focusing on the patient. And indeed, we had an input from uh, somebody from Frederick Linden from the Swedish hub coordinator for the My Data Global Network. And he's saying that it was already clear in 2000 that the only way of having patient information follow them globally is by creating a system that's patient mediated. In other words, as, as Yirki said, you could swipe in or swipe out if you don't trust someone. Well, panel, what do you think is the main barrier to creating such a system? Who wants to pick up on that one? Godfrey, shall I come to you? <laughs> yes, well, it's, it's a very tricky question. Uh, I think, um, it, let me put it in a positive way. I think the, the, the possibility of digitalization, of using sensors, of using variables, of having individual vital parameters really gives us the, sh the chance, the opportunity to really finally create a patient mediated um, um, health system. And I think this is, so we are, you know, just because now we are at the, I think at the tipping point where we really are capable to offer a better and personalized medical health care because I will base my treatment on your individual data, on your data of the last six weeks, not on the you know, on the on the just on our on our knowledge of the last hundred years, looking at you, telling you are thirty five, you're a man, your weight is like this, your height is like this. So I think we are really at the tipping point to create a patient mediated um, a healthcare system. On the other hand, to be very honest, um, this system works or follows the reimbursement system. You know, I think there you can do a lot of. Um, you can do a lot of legislative approaches and whatever. If you want to have the system patient-oriented, patient-centered, if you want to have the system data-centered, data-followed, you have to adapt the reimbursement system um, to incentivize people to follow this. Um, and I think this is just a broad answer to the broad question. 
Okay, thank you. And I know, Talia, you wanted to come in on this, but I, before I bring you in, I do have one more input uh, from the audience that I think is linked to this. And this is here, we have an input um, from Ian Henderson, a solutions architect for the Data Lab in Edinburgh. And he said that COVID-19 shows us that individuals would benefit from being able to access and reuse aspects of their core medical data. Godfrey, as you said, you know, being able to share what's been happening with you in the last six weeks, not just your historical re uh, record. What's the best way we make this a reality? And I think, Taria, this may link into what you wanted to say. Yeah, um, I wanted to build on, uh, on both comments, actually. But what Godfrey said, I think the one uh, of making this really patient-centric is for patients to really realize that they can take much more handle of their own health. Uh, the system used to be very, you know, doctor or healthcare center centric. And today people realize that actually I can have the data available in my hand, in my wearable. I can take a better control of what fits to my health. And of course, kind of trust is is is, is key uh, element of that. And I don't know if Yurki wants to comment. I haven't lived in Finland for 15 years, but for, for some reason in Finland, uh, that never seemed to be a problem. I have number that I still remember by heart and behind that number, all data is, is served. Uh, and not only for the purposes of somebody else following things, but for me to be able, available and have all my health data uh, easily available for myself. And I realize this is not true everywhere else where I have lived around the Europe. So kind of this patient trust and patient being able to take a benefit of that data easily. And I think the pandemic is a, is, a, is a good way of saying that, you know, if I would understand the data, if I would know where those patients who, who have COVID are, I can avoid them. If everybody shares data, I can actually prevent myself of being ill. Or if I do happen to fall ill, maybe I can get an understanding how should I be treated if other people share the data anonymously and safely. Well, we're going to stay in Finland for a moment because, and I'll come to you, to you, Yirki, because we've had another input, and this is from Vivi Latoneya, who is a data specialist for the city of Helsinki, and she's asking exactly that question, Taria. How do, is it that we seem to forget? patients, the actual subjects of health data, they're often forgotten in the discussions about the policies and the benefits of health data sharing. We talk a lot about how the systems will become more efficient and more effective. Um, Yirki, how do you, in Finland, this is an area that's obviously been at the core of the way that you've approached it. Why is it that patients, the subjects of data, get forgotten so often when we talk about the benefits of health data sharing? I think it's, uh, it's uh, because of deep culture we have adopted or we have accepted decades ago where patient or customer is only an objective so not the subject of being responsible of his or her own health so we go to see doctor and he or she tells me what to do and what's wrong with me and i'm just receiving information and in the worst case, I don't even understand the information I, I, I'm given by a doctor. So it's, sometimes the language even is so complicated, I don't even understand uh, what's the thing. So, so this is a cultural issue, and I don't want to blame anybody because uh, there's been a good faith behind. There are highly educated doctors and, and healthcare professionals who knows everything uh, related to healthcare much better than I do. But, um, but, and it has been very easy for us as a patient to outsource the responsibility to the professionals. But now when technology makes it easier to uh, get additional information, uh, real-time information about my health, it changes or it brings new opportunities. And, um, and uh, I, I think this is the main question. We have relatively well-functioning uh, digital system in Finland. It's called MyKanta, which is a health register which collects all your health data and you can visit there whenever you want. If you want to check who was the doctor, what was the diagnosis five years ago, what kind of Medicare I was uh, given, etc. So it, it gives me as a patient or as a client a chance to look what, 
how what what my health has been like and it, it gives a new opportunity to be a part of the solution part of the co designer of uh, of new healthcare methods i don't know if uh, i answered these questions but um, th th what i tried to say is that we have cultural reasons why things are like they are today but they can be changed Okay, well, this is a good point, the fact that we can change things because we're just at the, the launch of the proposals around the health data space. And we know that the Commission's planning to have a, a Data Governance Act. And we have an input here from Karolina Makiewicz, who's asking us about how we make sure that the Data Governance Act is very human-centered. She has, has, um, works on the European Connected Health Alliance, and she's done a word search in uh, the European data strategy. And 66 times we talk about humans and persons and individuals. So how do we make sure that when we the new proposals around governance actually start from the patient? And I'd like to actually chain that input with another input that we've received from Dr. Bertrand Mesco, um, who's the uh, European young leader and the founder of um, the Futurist, his medical futurist. And he's saying, how do we fulfill the promise of the patient being the point of care. So panel there, we've got two messages. First of all, when we look at the regulation of data, making sure that patients and humans, it's human centric. And secondly, that the promise that digital health is that the patient is actually the, the place where everything happens and is in control. How do we make that happen? Godfrey, would you like to pick up on those? Well, I think um, there were so many things already already said, and I just I just could you know underline, for example, was what Taria already said. I, I mean, we can say the patient you are you are having the control about your data. It's the first time, right? With the electronic medical record, for example, just having a little example, I have my data with me all the time. I can decide with which kind of doctor I want to share my data. We will have, I see that at least at the question of software as a medical device, what we are fostering here in Germany, we will have so many opportunities for self-centered also treatments for, for helping me, for assisting me. And so this is really moving forward. I'm not at all worried about that the, the future of a digitalized healthcare system will be not patient-centered. I'm far more worried about that we as Europe will take the opportunity and will lead this movement by allowing to use the data in the, you know, to help the patient. I don't, I see that there is, you know, this is really a, a, a big step forward to use data and to give the opportunity to the patient. And I think this will be by definition a, a huge support for patients. So. I'm, I'm more worried, as I already mentioned, that we not only write those absolutely right sentences like data saves lives into papers, we have to act at the regulatory framework. And the crucial point will be, do we really create a better code of conduct for the GDPR? And do we have a reliable framework, uh, uh, first of all, second, Will we be successful with the joint action group to have a semantically also standardized data set which we really can which we really can connect and then use? I think those are the the positions which we really should foster in Europe, uh, and then we will create a patient centered um, uh, system uh, at the same time. Well, you mentioned the fact that you know we we're moving away from thinking about health just as transactions in hospitals and around medicines, but that we're now looking at software as a service and how we open up our concepts of health and how data could transform this. Well, we've had an input from Chiara Clancy. She's got a comment about where she sees the next area where data could really revolutionise an aspect of health, and she's putting the focus on digital therapeutics. And she said that. We're now seeing clearer regulatory pathways and significant growth in this area of digital therapeutics. She thinks this could be the next frontier in medicine. So, panel, let me ask you, you know, where do you see the new breakthroughs coming forward? 
Chiara thinks it's going to be in therapeutics. Godfrey, you mentioned, you know, software as a service as really understanding how health systems work. You know, um, let me come to you, Yirki. Where are you, you, you're focusing on innovation in your day job. Where do you see the next big area of breakthroughs coming from, from digital and health? I think the next breakthroughs comes from the additional or increasing use of uh, real-time personal data. But in order to, this to happen, we need uh, better trust and potentially enabling regulatory environment so that everybody has a clear view how my data is used and, uh, and that the regulation makes the use of data transparent. So I, I believe in that. Of course, knowing that there, there are differences between our member states on, on trust factor. In some countries, people trust more to the public authorities, whereas in some other countries, the trust is not as high as in some, some, somewhere else. But um, nevertheless, uh, we need common set of rules for using data and allowing uh, individuals to provide data for for uh, service providers. Okay, I, I think I'll show you our, our next input from Jorge Fernandez Garcia, who is a director of uh, innovation at the EIT Health and European Young Leader. And he's made the very ambitious message that goes to what you're talking about, Yirki. You said that, you know, we need to build trust in data and health systems. And he's projecting that in 10 years, we're going to trust data more than our own doctor because the computer has access to a huge amount of information and data and will be more up to date, more informed than our doctors. Now, this sounds exciting and interesting, but a lot of people are, uh, this would be their worst fear that the human empathetic connection you get when you deal with a healthcare professional is somehow replaced by a robot that's all seeing and all knowing, but doesn't see me as an individual and as a person. So is this a utopia that we've got here or is this a dystopia? Panel members. <laughs> Tarja. Well, um, maybe a build on this one, and I think it a little bit uh, includes what Jurki was saying. I, I think where the innovation and using the computer and the data, you know, we have already many elements. We have therapeutics, we have doctors, but really connecting all this that will be very tailored. This whole digital can enable it. If I give an example, you have a patient who has diabetic you know, chronic disease, they go once a year to a doctor for intervention. In the future, they might have a connected pen who actually reads when do they take uh, insulin, something that reads their blood pressure, blood sugar constantly. You have an IA that combines all this data and tells actually patients what to do, what not to do, how much insulin to take, when to go to a doctor. So it doesn't exclude uh, other interactions but it will help uh, to predict, and as I said, to make more control, more out of your therapeutics, more out of your interventions uh, to yourself. Then questions come in, you know, for example, if we start using automatic intelligence or machine learning, you know, who is really accountable of those interventions opens the complete another scary part. We know already that in some instances, you know, machines are better, machine learning has enabled, you know, imagine reading to be almost better than a doctor eye. But those kind of scary questions can come in. But you know, if decisions are made by and traumatic intelligence, who is who is accountable? But I think it's not any particular element itself, it's just combining all these elements that we have through digital and, uh, and analytics to a, to a better tailored um, treatments or, or approaches for patients. Okay, well, let me ask you this already, and Godfrey, I, I note I'll come to you. Already doctors now complain that their patients come in having consulted Dr. Google before they come in. And they say, oh, I need this. I've got these symptoms. They've self-diagnosed. They've chosen not to follow the medication regime because of something they've read on a Facebook group. And that's already now. When we start moving to a future where data is driving much more of the health decisions, how do we ensure that we can really trust it? And if, you know, Godfrey, you talked about having, you know, the last six weeks of real world evidence of what's happening in your body by your wearables to talk to your doctor. What happens if you say, well, doctor, I don't agree. I, I and my machines think something different. And Talia talked about the, how do you get the liability issue dealt with? 
you know, how do we navigate this way forward? Godfrey. So, yes, first of all, I, I would just like, you know, to come back to the question, will we trust more the computer or the doctor? I think actually the computer will help the doctor to focus on his, on his, on his treatment in a different way. So I don't see that the doctor will be, you know, will be kind of, will be gone in 10 years. It's more, he will, he will have a, a different kind of job description and it will help him actually to be more precise. And just to underline also what Jörg said, a little example with the vital parameters. If you see like there is a study at the Charité here in Berlin, heart insufficiency. Yes, just, you know, today you go after, after your surgery, you go every two weeks to your doctor. And now they have a study where it's just taking your vital parameters and then it's decided when do you go to your doctor. And just this level kind of using data uh, led to a, to a mortality rate before it was by 11%, now it's by 8%. So three people out of 100 die less just using data. And I think this is the development we will see, like also Taria said, with diabetes and a lot of chronic diseases in the upcoming years. And this will fundamentally change the way of how also doctors work. Um, first of all, second, coming to your coming to your initial questions, I think um, you know we are really at a tipping point where the the way of how a doctor works, the way of how a health system works, really will change fundamentally. And if you go back to times like when the X-ray were, were, was invented, right, and you read the comments of doctors' associations back at the time to the X-ray. It's like you get an idea of, you know, that, you know, there will be there will be progress and also doctors will adapt to the progress and will use it. So it's more a kind of transformation process where we will have to guarantee I, I, that you are absolutely right. Um, the, the liability, the trust into technology and we as also the regulator have to work on that. So how do can we. Um, build trust in, in artificial intelligence and algorithms and, and how can we offer transparency. This will be the, the major task for the regulator, for the industry, for everyone else. But I think this is like all the time in medical history when we moved forward, also the industry together with the regulator, together with all the stakeholders, were capable to build a new framework and we are just on the move. Okay. I think one element we should not forget in, and is that after eight or nine months of, of lockdown, we crave human contact. I mean, you and I are all talking to each other through a screen, and this has mediated our connections for the last six to nine months. And what an impact this has already had on our mental health in terms of a rise in loneliness, isolation, stress, depression, burnout. I think one of the interesting areas of growth of um, the health data space in the future is going to be supporting people's emotional well-being, encouraging connection. I think that's an area that hasn't been mentioned yet, but I think it's it's one that we'll certainly be picking up on. We're coming towards the end of our time together, and I'd like to ask each of our panellists to reflect on one big idea they think the EU should take forward so that we can really achieve this potential of a health data space that saves lives. We've, we've talked about trust, we've talked about regulation, we've talked about liability, we've even talked about business models. But um, I'm, I'm going to ask each of you, what's the one big idea that we should take away and start working on as a way of creating the potential to come forward? And let's go in the order that we started with. So I'll start with you, Godfrey. What's your big idea for Europe? So it's not sexy at all, but I think it's the standardization of data. Because if we don't have a high quality and standardized data set, we can't connect data, we can't uh, analyze data. So I think this is the major focus, although it's not that sexy, but we should really emphasize on that. Okay, thank you. Yirki, standardized data, let's take that as a tick already. What's your big idea? Yeah, actually, it was a very good point, what Godfrey said. It's uh, the basis for everything. But uh, I also try to be very concrete, and I see it important that the EU would have a legislation uh, for the secondary use of health data. It would help a lot. Excellent. So we've standardized the data, and then we have a level playing field, so it's clear to everyone how we could reuse that data to analyze and generate new insights and knowledge. Okay. Tari, if I had a magic wand and could grant a wish, what's your big idea at European level? Uh, I would really ensure that EMA, European uh, Medical Authorities, have really standardized and aligned framework 
of really how to use data for approving, uh, for advising industry how to design trials and evidence creation through real world evidence like we have in the US with an FDA. I think that's something that would be extremely important to be able to accelerate innovation and bringing new therapeutics to patients. Great. Thank you, all three speakers, for being very concrete and very clear in what you think Europe should do. And of course, in the last few days, Europe has set out a very ambitious proposal for the European health data space. And it's linked to the new agreement that's been found on the multi-annual financial framework, which has seen a much bigger envelope for health, for research and for education. And these are all areas that are building blocks of the health data space. The Commission is proposing a new Data Governance Act, which will update and put the GDPR, the Data Protection Regulation, into a broader context. Now, the GDPR took five years to negotiate. Let's hope this one's faster, because we can see that the need is urgent. The Commission has also proposed a major upgrade to the European Medicines Agency. As Taria mentioned, it needs to be able to integrate direct new information and real-world evidence in assessing its medicines. The Commission is also proposing a much tighter connection between a beefed-up European Medicines Agency and a bigger mandate for the European Centre for Disease Control, with more power to directly take action to declare a health emergency, but also an ability to link up geospatial data and data that comes from outside the health sector to link it up with epidemiological data so we have a much stronger pattern of information that's going forward. It's also proposing that the European health data space would aggregate data coming in from the European Medicines Agency around early surveillance um, of medicines, adverse events, to be able to get that information connecting to the epidemiological information that's coming in from the ECDC. So there's huge plans for this health data space. And if we get it right, as was mentioned right at the beginning, it'll be the first time that we try to regulate a space by a, from democratic countries using a social market basis, understanding that it's for the public good rather than just for private enterprise. So this is a, a brand new enterprise we're all starting out on. And I hope over the next few years we'll be able to talk more. And at Friends of Europe, we have upcoming activities that will be looking at the issues of how we transform our health systems so they're fit for the purpose, for the challenges of now and for the future. So let me say a warm thank you to my three speakers, to Godfrid, to Yirki and Taria for joining me, and for you, the audience, for watching this. I hope you'll be part of our future conversations. Thank you very much and goodbye.